Heavenly Father, we give thanks this evening for that truth that you are the one who does not slumber, who does not sleep, that you are the one who is ever-present, that you are the one always with us, that you are the one who cannot be undone or unbound, that you are the one who is without limitation, that you are the God of creation. And Father, we pray this evening that as we gather that we would be those who would be faithful unto you just as Daniel was, that we would be those who are characterized by a steadfast, immovable faithfulness, that regardless of what may come to pass in life, that regardless of the circumstance that we may find ourselves, regardless of the pressure that may be applied, regardless of the oppression that may follow, regardless of the hostility that may be faced, that we would stand and stand firm in the truth of Scripture and with the great promise that You are always with us. Lord, we pray for a willing faithfulness like that of Daniel, that we would be willing to empty ourselves and look unto Jesus, that we would be willing to put others before us in true gospel humility, that we would be those who would exercise and display, demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. Lord God, we recognize that so often in the development of these attributes and the development of these characteristics, it is realized through adversity that through the trials, through the difficulties, through the oppressive times, though we walk in the valley of shadow of death, we shall fear none, in, none ill, for Thou art with us, that You are with us always, and You use all of these means and all of these experiences, all of the providence that befalls us in order to grow us for our good and for Your glory. And so, Lord, we pray that we would rest and delight in You this evening. Lord, we thank You for Your Word, that great revelation of Yourself to us, that You have taken uh, Yourself and have displayed Yourself to us, and through this revelation of redemptive, uh, redemptive history, that You have shown Yourself time and time again to be a God who is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, that You are full of righteousness and integrity and goodness and mercy and love and grace. And so, Lord, we pray that we would see that tonight as we come to a passage of Scripture that is challenging, as we look at uh, elements of it that stretch us and that in some ways feel inaccessible to us, 
Lord, we thank you that all of these, what we might consider incidental uh, details, are there as a means by which providing a cohesive picture of the redemptive narrative, that your Word is in harmony with itself, that there is no contradiction found within. And Lord, we thank you for everything that points to the veracity and the trustworthiness of your Word. We remember this evening those who are uh, faced with difficulty within their own experience. We think particularly of our friend Shirley. We pray that you would be with her in Ragmore, uh, having suffered a stroke. And Lord, we pray that you would restore her in your time and according to your will. We pray for her family in these days, and we pray that you would strengthen and sustain, and that as a church family, we might uh, uphold her before the throne of grace and may offer practical support where appropriate and where necessary. Lord, we remember others too uh, who are going through particularly uh, uncertain times. We think uh, particularly of uh, Rod McKenzie. We remember him and Kathy and the wider family. We pray for Rod in the week ahead for the tests that will be carried out. Lord, we pray that you would guide the hands of those attending to him. We pray for uh, Linda as she ministers grace uh, to her brother. Uh, and we pray that, uh, as we pray, that you would reveal yourself to him and that he would uh, know you and know the presence and peace uh, of your spirit with him. Lord, we remember others who are going through treatment and have been for quite some time. We remember the likes of Stefan and Alistair. Uh, McPherson, we remember Dick McLeod, and uh, others, Lord, would you be with them? We remember those who mourn, those whose hearts are heavy, those who are uh, burdened with uh, a saddened and a sorrowful heart. Lord, would you be with them? We pray also, too, for those who rejoice. We rejoice with Reiner and Sheila Lucan in the birth of a, a sixth grandchild earlier today. We thank you for that young man's life, and we pray that you would bless him and make your face to shine upon him and give him peace, Lord, that he would grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, that he would become mighty uh, for you and for your purposes in this world, and that you would bless them uh, as a family. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bless us now and go before us, opening your word to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Ten points to anyone who could tell me what the first reading was last Sunday evening. Really? Not Acts, no, we didn't read now. I won't put anyone on the spot. We read from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And the closing verse of 2 Timothy chapter 3 are these words, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man or the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's a challenging verse for every preacher, especially when you come to a passage like Daniel chapter 7, and you realize that, okay, I can't just body swerve this. I can't just say, well, you know, we've done Daniel, we've done chapters 1 to 6, and that's been great, and now we're going to move on to something else, which would be really, in some ways, preferable. Um, but that's not what we're going to do. Uh, we are tasked with moving through Scripture, and that's what we seek to do here, is we seek to exposit, expository preaching, mining uh, what is before us to, to gain the application of how that is relevant to us and why that should help us uh, in the current day uh, and how relevant it is to us in our own experiences and in our own lives. Up until this point, the book of Daniel has been fairly straightforward. It has been a narrative sort of style of book. There have been stories. Uh, drawing application from that is relatively straightforward, and I think you'll agree that the application, well, I hope that you'll agree that the application that we've drawn from that has been helpful, practically helpful, challenging, absolutely challenging as we look and we see one in Daniel who is um, so committed, that has uh, such conviction, that is so steadfastly faithful to God regardless of his circumstance, even whilst in captivity, even whilst under the cosh, as it were, of a pagan ruler, even whilst having to serve that pagan king and doing it with great aplomb to the point that he's distinguished from everybody else because of his excellent spirit, the excellent attributes that he possesses. So, it's been relatively easy uh, for us to draw, or, or certainly there's been an abundance of application that we can draw uh, from that. And Daniel, he, he did well, he did well as he went into the lion's den, but when you put Daniel into the den of the critics, 
it's maybe something slightly different. Now, chapter 6 ends the chronological uh, account of Daniel, the historical part, if you will, with a little prediction. But now we get into the apocalyptic, the, the prophecy part of Daniel from, verse, from chapter 7 uh, on. The best way to describe Daniel is to say the first six chapters are really history with a wee bit of prediction, a wee bit of prophecy, and the latter chapters are prophecy with a little bit of history. So, it's, it's changing the direction completely uh, on it. And in some ways, what we look at this evening is, is a broad overview. Uh, we're not going to get into the, the nitty-gritty. We haven't read the whole chapter. The whole chapter, is, there's a lot in it. We're going to take a few weeks uh, to go through that. But I want to kind of have a, a broad overview of, of why this kind of material is helpful for us uh, as we live our lives as Christian believers, uh, because it helps us to form a defense Peter says that we should always be ready to give a defense for the, or to give a reason for the hope that is within us, uh, to be able to defend the truth, to be able to contend earnestly for the truth, as Jude uh, puts it. We cannot do that uh, unless we have a, a firm and thorough understanding of not only the faith that we possess, but from where that faith arises and the facts that bolster that faith or that faith that are evidence for that faith, faith, that are foundational for that faith. And we find that in and through the book of Daniel in bucket loads. There is loads of evidence that is helpful. But Daniel is a particularly contentious book when it comes to the critics. There has always been a lot of, I, I, hasten to, I hesitate to use the word backlash, but there has always been a lot of input from the critics when it comes to Daniel, and especially these prophetic words and verses that always elicit a lot of interest, but a lot of critique as well. So, hopefully this evening, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, correcting, training in righteousness. So, bear that thought at the forefront of your mind as we begin to dive deep in, into uh, God's Word. Three things very briefly this evening. Number one, Daniel documented the future. Daniel documents the future. Daniel saw things in a vision. Daniel wrote things down that he saw in the vision. The things that Daniel wrote down that he saw in the vision came to pass. That's the, the simple sequence of events. But it's interesting that even within this chapter that has all about a historical setting, um, that, that, that is all about prophecy, sorry, about the future, we have a historical setting. So, proper names are given. He mentions Belshazzar. We might be thinking, ah, hang on a minute, Belshazzar was two chapters before, and he died at the hands of Darius the Mede. What is happening here? Well, like I say, that was the chronological uh, conclusion of, of the book, and now we are into, we are into the uh, prophecy part. So, this is a, a slightly different. It's going from the third person to the first person. Daniel is now talking, I, Daniel, saw. Uh, up until this point, it's been written in the third person. So, proper names are given. Belshazzar's mentioned. We know where Daniel is. He's in Babylon. Uh, we know roughly how long he's been there. Uh, we certainly know he was longing to get back to where uh, he came from. So, we've got all these things that are helpful, but ultimately in chapter 7, we've got a problem. And the problem is, I suppose you could say, an incredible problem. It's a difficult problem. The problem is this, because there are so many detailed predictions of the future that have actually come true, Daniel raises the interest or draws the inquiry from the critical mind, from the skeptics, from those who would seek to degrade and uh, mock Scripture. So, for example, Daniel chapter 11, there are 35 verses and there are 135 predictions, prophecies that have been fulfilled within those verses. Of 35 verses, 135 predictions of future events that have come to pass. That is why Daniel is of such interest to the critics. Now, you might be sitting there this evening and thinking, well, how's that a problem? Surely that's a good thing. Surely if people are seeing these things, that is really good. I say, well, Here's a, an illustration of, of what I mean. Um, there was one uh, scholar who, who tells the, 
the story of having ten pre-marked coins in his pocket, marked one to ten. And he says to the crowd, I'm going to take out coin number one. And you say, okay. He reaches into his pocket. He's got a one in ten chance. He pulls out the coin with number one on it. We think, oh, fair, well done. Great. And then he says, and now I'm going to co- pull out coin number two. Well, his, his odds begin to decrease exponentially from that point. And then he pulls out coin number two. Now I'm going to co- pull out coin number three, and we're thinking, ah, really? Coin number three comes out four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Wow. We would probably give that chap a round of applause. We might be awed by that feat. But a good majority of people would also be thinking, scam, magician, nah, this isn't right. He, he couldn't do that. It's a fix. There's something behind this. There's no way that that can actually be the case. Well, that's the same as what we have with the critics when it comes to Daniel. When the unbeliever, when the unbelieving critic comes to Scripture, comes to the Bible, they approach the Bible with, I think, two predispositions. Predisposition number one is that they say, they state, they own, they, they propose that we live in a closed system and the miraculous is impossible. And predisposition number two is that because premise number one is true, that there is no miraculous things, we live in a closed system, therefore the things that are written about Daniel, because they really happened, they must have been written after the fact, not before. So we say Daniel is prophecy, Daniel is writing things about the future, Daniel is writing about things that have not yet come to pass. But the critics saying, ah, ah, no way, fixed. There's no way they could have done that. It's too detailed. It's too intricate. It must have been written by somebody afterwards and then attributed to Daniel because there's no way that it was that supernaturally imposed upon this man. Now, we as Christian believers have no, no problem with prophecy in one sense because we attribute sovereignty to God. That God is the sovereign God, that He is able to do all things, that He is the one who has a plan and a purpose from Genesis to Revelation. His redemptive purposes have been revealed to us. They have not yet reached their conclusion because the world is still as we know it. But God is orchestrating history. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is uh, all-knowing. So, when He gives these meticulous, detailed, intricate prophecies, we don't have an issue. But the unbeliever has a problem because of these predispositions that they have. Closed system, there's nothing supernatural, can't be true, can't have happened, must have been a forgery, must have been done by somebody else. And that's why the critic says things like, the Red Sea wasn't really the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. And the Reed Sea was only about 18 inches deep, and the Israelites, they waded through the Reed Sea okay, so how did the Egyptian army drown in 18 inches of uh, muddy water? It wasn't manna that fell from heaven. It was uh, just a sap that appears on, on desert bushes common in the Sinai Peninsula. The resurrection of Jesus clearly never took place because we know that that stuff just does not happen. You've never seen anyone raised from the dead because nobody is raised from the dead. Nobody is resurrected. Nobody has that power. Oh, but what about all the witnesses that saw him after his death? Oh, well, they must have been sleepless. They must have been hallucinating. They must have been uh, seeing things in their period of mourning. Maybe Jesus didn't die at all. He just swooned and kind of passed out. He almost died, but he didn't die. Or Daniel didn't write this book. No, no, it was somebody else that wrote the book after Daniel and attributed all of these things to Daniel. That's what the skeptics believe. That's what many of the critics say. A little bit of history. In the third century AD, a guy by the name of uh, Porphyry, who was a Neoplatonic philosopher, uh, he was a pagan. He wrote 15 volumes of a book called Against the Christians. That was his life work. Uh, uh, you know, a happy go lucky kind of guy. Against the Christians. He did not like Christians. Uh, he wanted to, to destroy the teachings of Christianity about. Uh, this one true living God, and he wanted to defend the system of polytheism, polytheism, many, many gods. 
And he had a particular dislike for Daniel uh, and for the prophecy of uh, Daniel. And he was the one to say that somebody else had written the book of, of Daniel, that it wasn't written during the period that Daniel, that it stated that Daniel was written in the sixth century BC. No, no, it was written by some unknown Jew in about 165 BC, during the Maccabean intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This, this Judean, this, this person wrote all of these things that Daniel actually predicted would happen that had come to pass and then attributed it back to Daniel. So, about 400 years after the time that we say that Daniel had written these things and seen these visions, they're saying, no, no, it, it wasn't then. It was 165 that it happened. Now, we say, what's the big deal? Why on a Sunday evening when I come to worship and I come to, to, to wait upon God, why am I thinking about these things? Why is this, why is this even a thing? Why is this important? Well, I'll tell you why it's important. Because if Daniel the prophet is false, if the prophecy of Daniel is a forgery, then the whole credibility of Jesus Christ goes down the tubes. The Scripture is all dovetailed, interlinked, inter interconnected, intertwined. If Daniel is a forgery, if the credibility of Daniel's prophecy is called into question, the whole credibility of Jesus is called into question. Why do I say that? Matthew, Jesus Himself said, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. He didn't see when you see, he didn't say when you see the abomination of desolation as spoken of by Daniel the, the, the forgery or Daniel the, the, the critic or Daniel the one that we don't really know when, when it was written. No, he doesn't say that. He says Daniel the prophet. Not only that, but during the entire New Testament, the documents of Peter and Paul and John, who all wrote apocalyptic literature, though they had fresh inspiration and revelation from God, of course, a lot of what they wrote was actually based in, based upon the revelation of Daniel that are recorded for us in this book. Somebody said it much better than me, Sir Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton wrote more about Christian apologetics than he did about science. You remember what Isaac Newton discovered? Maybe the children can tell us. Maybe Lachlan can tell us. You know what Isaac Newton discovered? Well, he didn't really discover it, but he observed it. What would happen if I, dropped, if I let go of this cup just now? Got yeah, well what would happen if I dropped this cup? Gravity. No, it would fall because of gravity. Exactly. Sir Isaac Newton, but he wrote more about the Christian faith than he did about science, and he said this, whoever rejects the prophecies of the book of Daniel does as much as if he undermined the Christian religion. So, in other words, if this is fake, if this isn't true, what are we doing here? Why are we here? Why are we getting dressed up? Why are we coming out on a cold, dark, frosty night? Why are we sitting in a building that's freezing, that's warming up uh, now? Why are we doing it? If it's all false, then we, above all people, says Paul, are to be pitied. If Christ has not risen, if Daniel is not true, then what are we doing here? So, Daniel documented the future. Secondly, Daniel is defended by the facts. Daniel is defended by the facts. Evidently, Daniel went to bed, he went to sleep, and his dream turned into a vision. He woke and he was able to see these things, a vision being slightly different from a dream, uh, uh, and he was able to note these things down. And note, he, he mentions the Great Sea. This is probably the Mediterranean, most likely. There are only four seas that are mentioned in the Bible. There's the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiber Tiberias later, uh, the Dead Sea, the Red Sea, and the Great Sea. So, the Great Sea is most likely the Mediterranean. So, Daniel in his vision is transported back to familiar territory, to the land that he grew up in, a land that he longs to be back in, Judea, and off the coast of that, that, that place is the great Mediterranean Sea, and he sees in, its, in his vision this sea all 
stirred up. Again, names, places, context is given to us, which is uh, helpful. And Daniel begins to write what uh, begins to write down what he saw, and what he saw in the sixth century uh, BC, not later. And Daniel is defended by three things, just before we get to have a quick look uh, at some of the things that he saw. He's defended by three things. Firstly, Daniel is defended by archaeology. You see, for centuries, the critics said, Daniel's a fake. Daniel, I mean, there's one thing that, that just sets it apart as a fake, because it's this name Belshazzar. Belshazzar never existed. Belshazzar is not in the historical record. We've never found any mention, any record of Belshazzar. Therefore, Daniel talks about him, so Daniel must be false. So, book by book, year after year, critic after critic says you can't trust the Bible because Belshazzar is never mentioned in, in history, and therefore he never existed, and therefore you can't trust the Bible until 1854, when an archaeological dig in the southern part of Iraq dug up a clay cylinder with cuneiform writing on it, and among other things was written a prayer for the good health and long life of King Nabonidus of Babylon and his son Belshazzar. And who was Belshazzar? Not just the king, not just the, the son of King Nabonidus, but the co-regent of King Nabonidus, the one who ruled in Babylon on behalf of his father. And in that moment, all of these critics from all of these years are blown completely out of the water through the authenticity of the biblical narrative. So, archaeologically, Daniel is defended. Secondly, he's defended through paleography. Now, paleography was not me trying to be smart. Uh, I was just looking for a, a word that rhymed with archaeology. So, this is paleography, and paleography is simply the study of old documents. It's manus manuscript evidence. It's looking at things that, 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 that give weight to the authenticity of documents. And all of the manuscript evidence points to an early writing of Daniel, not the late writing. All of it points to an early writing. You remember the Septuagint? Some of you, have, I'm sure, have heard of the Septuagint. Uh, the Septuagint version of the Bible is the most famous translation uh, of Scripture from the Old Testament, translated from the Greek into uh, from the Hebrew into Greek around 275 BC. Uh, it was done by scholars in Alexandria in Egypt. 275 BC is about 110 years earlier than the supposed forger who came along and wrote the book of Daniel postscript. So, as we look at the Septuagint version of the Bible translation, uh, and as we see that it was, it was written in 275 BC, we see it's 110 years before they're claiming that Daniel's written. What's in the Septuagint? The book of Daniel. Then there's the Dead Sea Scrolls, probably the greatest modern time archaeological find. The Dead Sea Scrolls, in them, uh, they are written Daniel in Hebrew and in Aramaic, but the Aramaic that it was written in was not the modern intertestamental uh, type of Aramaic, and there was a difference, but in the 6th century style Aramaic, when Daniel was supposed to have been written. So, Daniel is supported by archaeology. Daniel is supported by paleography. Daniel is supported by history. Seeing this vision, writing it down, writing several visions, putting the detail in, and these things have come to pass and are coming to pass. If you say something as a prophet and it never happens, you're known as a false prophet. But if you predict things, if you foretell things, and you sit back and let history take its course, and they come to pass, then you truly are a prophet. History proves Daniel's prophecies. We'll go through them in the weeks to come. We'll see some of them. Daniel predicts that four mighty nations will come. Three of them are already mentioned in the book of Daniel, the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of the Medo-Persians, 
and the kingdom of Greece. So, if a critic is to come and say, well, you know, the supernatural doesn't really happen, uh, and you know, the book of Daniel was written uh, a lot of years after, actually, they say it was, 400 years after they say it was, then what you have to do is you have to call archaeology a liar, you have to call textual criticism or manuscript evidence a liar, you have to call history a liar, and you have to call Christ a liar. The evidence is stacked against the critic and in favor of Scripture. The evidence is stacked against the skeptic. Now, prophecy scares us a bit. Well, it scares me anyway, especially when you have to to teach it. But prophecy is one of the facts that actually defends the accuracy of the Bible. Prophecy is a, a verification that what the Lord has given us is authentically true. And Daniel itself does that more than really any other book of the Bible. There are so many evidences, there's so many examples of that. We don't have time to go through them. There are hundreds, there are thousands, there are millions, most probably. God told Abraham in advance, your descendants will be in a foreign land for 400 years. That's exactly what happened, is it not? They were in bondage, the nation Israel, for 400 years in Egypt. God told the prophets of the Babylonian captivity before Babylon ever existed as a world power, and that the kingdom would last 70 years, the captivity. God told Isaiah, the prophet, that Babylon would be overthrown by King Cyrus. And it was written in the prophecy of Isaiah 200 years before Cyrus was born. His name was written in the Scripture. 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah predicted him, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And all of that is because Isaiah 46 reminds us, I am God, and there is no one else. There is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Prophecy. Only God can declare the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And that's what we find in Daniel 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Daniel 7 is perhaps the most comprehensive panoramic view of all prophecies in the Old Testament, probably in all of Scripture, actually. And it's quite incredible when you dig down into it and when you begin to see it and how it fits together and interconnects with every other uh, aspect of Scripture. And so, we're just highlighting a few things uh, this evening. So, Daniel documented the future. Daniel is defended by the facts. And thirdly, Dan, Daniel describes what follows. Uh, Daniel describes what follows. Daniel describes what follows. If we keep… We only read down to the verse Mark 14 this evening. But if you read verses 15, 16, 17, there is an interpreter that Daniel meets uh, who tells Daniel, oh, you know, Daniel, by the way, uh, those four beasts that you saw, they're four kingdoms that will arise out of the earth. Now, just before we go through these for just, just, very, uh, just touching on them very quickly, the dream that Daniel has corresponds closely with the dream, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had many years before. We've looked at that already he had dreamt of the huge statue. You remember that? The head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the, the, the torso and the, and the thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay, the ten toes, etc. Well, the dream that Daniel has of wild beasts is actually the same thing, but using different imagery. The question is why? Could it be that Nebuchadnezzar, as a pagan king, saw the world from the worldly perspective? But Daniel, as the servant of the Lord, saw it from God's perspective, from the heavenly perspective. The world is enamored with power, enamored by kingdoms, enamored with glory, and it sees this big gold statue. Wow. But when God looks at the world, He sees the world as ravenous beasts, bloody, fighting, 
destroying one another to gain power, to rob power. It's an accurate picture. It's an accurate depiction of the world that we live in yet today, is it not? We could survey history, and indeed we don't need to survey history. We can just look around at the present and see what is going on in the world and recognize there is no peace, but there is nation against nation. There is destruction. There is war. There is enmity like the sea being churned up kingdom after kingdom. So, Nebuchadnezzar sees things from a human perspective. God looks at it from a heavenly perspective and gives that perspective to Daniel. You know, like the time when Samuel is trying to find the next king of Israel, and he he goes to the house of Jesse, and before he meets David, he meets Eliab, the older brother, tall, dark, handsome, and he says, this, this will be the king. And the Lord says, no, mm -mm. I have rejected him, for God does not see as man sees. For a man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. I wonder what's in your heart this evening when it comes to the Lord. Daniel 7 shows us that God sees into the heart of these kingdoms, that He sees into the hearts of individuals. Verse 4 gives us the first beast. The first was like a lion. It had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the, man, the heart of a man was given to him. This corresponds to the head of gold in the statue, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. In archaeological discoveries of the city of Babylon, especially at the gates of the royal palaces, they found several examples of winged lions. That was a depiction of Babylon by the Babylonians, a winged lion. Why a winged lion? Well, the, ling, the, the lion was uh, king of the jungle, as we call it, the, the king of all the beasts. A winged lion was even more powerful, even more swift. It speaks of power and dominion and speed. All these things characterized Nebuchadnezzar and his rule. Nebuchadnezzar, in his triumph over the Egyptians, in his, in his conquest over the whole of the world at that time. And so, they cast a lion with wings that depicts the nation, but the wings were plucked off. And that would indicate a loss of power, a loss of speed. And most scholars agree that this is a depiction of Nebuchadnezzar being humbled by God, given a new heart, a different heart, after what came to pass. Verse 5, and there before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. A lopsided bear. It speaks of the Medo-Persian empire the chest and arms of silver on the, on the statue. Now, a bear is slower than a lion, more lumbering, you could say, than, than a lion. Not as agile as a lion, but a bear is strong. A bear has brute force. People speak of uh, Jamie there with his shotgun with a grizzly bear bearing down on top of him in, in Canada. It would take a serious bit of firepower to stop a grizzly bear on the rampage. And that's a great picture of the Medo-Persian empire, a great depiction of their strength. King Xerxes, for example, when he fought the Greeks, he was able to amass an army of 2,500,000 soldiers. You can't imagine an army of that size, and they moved slowly but with great power and with great force. The picture he is also of a lopsided bear. It's up on the ground and off two feet. It's, it's lopsided, and that's also a great depiction of the Medo-Persian coalition, because it was never an even union. The Persians were much more powerful than the Medes were, and history tells us that. Verse 6, you've got uh, another beast that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and was given authority uh, to rule. A leopard, surely, out of all the beasts so far, would be the most agile out of all of the animals. It would be incredibly fast, but give it four wings, and it would be very, very fast. It also had four heads, and a dominion was, was given to it. It's a perfect depiction of the kingdom of Greece. When Alexander the Great took over the world, 
in the beginning of 334 BC, there were two things that marked his kingdom. Number one, the speed of his victory, and number two, the speed of the breakup of his kingdom. He died when he was 31, and his kingdom was divided up, and it was given to the generals. And how many generals were there? Da, 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 four. Four generals. How could Daniel have known that? Well, he couldn't have known that unless the Lord had given it to him, or unless it was a forgery written many hundreds of years after the fact. We know that that's not the case. The seventh, and we'll touch more about this in the weeks to come, is this iron-toothed beast that there is. Unlike any of the other beasts so far, dreadful, terrible, exceedingly strong legs of iron, like the statue Nebuchadnezzar saw devouring people, but the main feature is its iron teeth. Historically, this has to be the iron rule of Rome, doesn't it? Like the legs of the statue, the longest part of the anatomy, Rome ruled for the longest not 200 years like most of the others, but 1,500 years. So, all of these things are, are, are picturesque. They're visions. They're representations of things that have come uh, to pass. We should maybe note a footnote. Revelation 13, if you want to do a bit of further study, Revelation 13, uh, where John sees a beast coming up out of the sea and describes the features of a leopard, a bear and a lion. All of these features making it unlike any other creature. The point is that through prophecy, via prophecy, by means of prophecy, God authenticates Himself and He validates His Word. He authenticates Himself and He validates Himself. He confirms the validity the veracity, the authenticity of His Word. And that raises a question, doesn't it? If all of these things are in place, and all of these things work in harmony together, and all of these things follow one another, and all of these things can be uh, affirmed archaeologically, uh, and through manuscript evidence, and through history itself, and through uh, the prophecy of the Lord by His servants. Why is it that people still want uh, to rubbish the, the Bible? Why do they still want to rubbish the Bible? Why do they still want to say, ah, that can't be true, this can't be true, when evidentially, evidently it is true, and it is real, and it is verifiable, and it is good? Well, it reminds me of the story I heard of a guy who was introduced to a microscope and was so enamored with this microscope that he was shown some things from nature, some flowers. He looked through the lens and he saw the complexity uh, and the intricacy and the beauty of these things. And he thought, I just have to have a, a microscope for myself. So he buys one, takes it home, shows it to his family. He's eating his dinner one night and he, he says, look at this. And he sticks his food underneath the microscope and to his horror, with the power of the microscope, he can see things that are maybe moving a little bit in his food. Not like, you know, I, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, these Bush Tucker trials, but, you know, really minute stuff. But he's absolutely horrified by the reality of these things in his food. So, what does he do? Smashes the microscope. It's a great picture, isn't it? What does the critic do with biblical truth? What do they do with the evidence that they're presented with? They get rid of the instrument that tells them the truth. They don't want to hear it. Because if these things are verifiably true, if we can lend weight to them, historically, archaeologically, biblically, prophetically, through eyewitness testimony, through personal experience, etc., 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 then if these things are true, the Bible is also true when it says that we are sinners in need of a Savior. The Bible is also true when it says that there is nothing that we can do to earn God's favor. The Bible is also true when it says that we need to repent and to believe. That's why the people want to destroy the Word of God so much, not because it reveals the future, but because it reveals their heart. 
because it reveals your heart and my heart and tells me that I am a sinner and tells me that by nature I am condemned as, our, uh, as an object of wrath before a holy God. But in Christ Jesus, I am offered life and life eternal, nothing through myself, nothing in my own merit, but all of God. That's the truth that people don't want to see under the microscope. And so destroy the microscope, destroy the Word, nullify the Word, disregard the Word. But as we open the Word, as we open the Bible, even in a passage like this that is inaccessible and is challenging to our minds, we find a Word that is reliable. We find a Word that is full of integrity. We find a Bible that's full of truth. And we find a God who has detailed the future in intricate detail. And if He can do that, do you not think He can handle our today and even our tomorrow? Let's dive deep with Him. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank You for Your Word, as challenging as portions of it can be for us and for our finite minds. Lord, we give thanks that You are indeed the Ancient of Days, that You are the one who has revealed Yourself, and regardless of what may come to pass, that we can have absolute confidence in You. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. We conclude by singing from the hymn, Ancient of Days. Let's stand and sing. Together. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still
his grace, mercy, and peace. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and remain with us all now and evermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Thank you.